that we have, okay, this is a way to look at the market. You have, this is a very simple exercise. You have a market 200 million, market A. You have here a market at 100 million, market B. The first one has two big companies that are here. And there are the competition, you have only two competitors here. This is about 100 million, so it's a smaller market. This is a thousand small companies that you have, and you have 10, 10 competitors. From you, obviously, which is the one that is most interesting? A. Y A. Interesting, why A? It depends. Okay, it depends. Okay. It depends on their market share. It depends on the market share. It depends if these two market players are dominant players, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to be able to be. Here, it seems that it is a more fragmented market. So it's a fragmented market that you have. You will have but there are pros and cons. This is good. Some of them are saying B, some of them are saying A. The logic behind A, it's a larger market. The logic behind A, it's only two companies behind it. The logic behind B, it is a smaller market, but you have a thousand companies behind. So you need to look and you have 10 competitors, so it's more fragmented. So it, depending how strong is your value proposition, if you feel that you have a value proposition stronger than these two competitors that are entrenched, that have their roots, they have the things, then go for A. If your value proposition is not as strong and you want to test it, you want to validate it, then you better start with a B car. So these will be the sort of, but interesting, you came up with the two. And I'm saying there is no one right or one wrong, it depending where you are in your product life cycle, it depending where you are in terms of how strong is your USP, unique selling proposition versus that of competition. Is this clear? Okay, so these will be examples. Uh, if you have questions, please interrupt. Okay, this one is quite important. This is, um, uh, you have now, we go, uh, I use Michelle, but we could maybe, uh, uh, so Michel comes, and if you let Michel speak for about 15 minutes, he will tell you about the 15 different growth initiatives that he's facing in this uh, group. And each one of them is very valid. So he has different products or service offering that could address different customer pain points across the market. Now the issue is what? Prioritizing. It's prioritizing. How do you prioritize? So what are the criteria that you use to prioritize? This exercise needs to be done with Michelle, and this is a big time exercise. We had the board meeting a week ago. One of the outcomes of the board meeting, we need to have, we looked at these different initiatives. How are we going to prioritize? What are the product or service that we're going to offer? So I'm asking you, you're now the board. So what should be the criteria? What applies to Michelle applies to any one of you. What should be the criteria? Because all of you are very creative. You have different initiatives. You have different product and services offering. How do you go about prioritizing one versus the other? What are the criteria to prioritize? Okay, let me rephrase the, the question to make sure you understand. So each of your company, take Atelier du Miel. Atelier du Miel would say, look, we have honey. But then we have also honey derivatives. Anam el Ma'amul made stuff out of honey. Then we have other products that could be snacks that are made out of honey. We then we have, no, we then have the, by the way, they have a great workshop on this thing. So in the workshop, we're going to serve food and we're going to serve all things. We're going to have our shop here, but this is a different experience that we have. Okay, so we have. We also have the possibility to do franchising across different countries in the Middle East because a lot of people are coming in here and are approaching us. But we also know that France is the biggest market in terms of honey. If we establish ourselves in France, we'll be extremely strong and this will build up. So there are a number. Each of these initiatives have an investment. Okay? We need to decide. How do we go about deciding, being it at Atelier du Miel, being it at B-Synchro, being it at Cardio Diagnostic, being at Mentis, how do you go about deciding which are the priorities that you're going to go after? I'm sorry, one one. So, Joanna. Okay, so before you get to the return, first you need to say is how much is basically the investments. You need to look at what is the investments. So this is the first question. Is you need to understand the investments in terms of dollar. The, the same one want to return, what sort of return? So you have the return. What are the returns that you're going to get? I'm investing this, I'm opening Kenya, I'm setting up the distributor on my office, it's costing me $300,000. How much revenue is Kenya going to generate? How much profit is going to generate? So what are the returns? And from these two, we will get some sort of return on investment. Typically, this could be internal rate of return. If we do a discount cash flow, it could be your net present value. It could be your payback period. It could be uh, different elements that you have, but I need to have an idea about what is your investments and what can I expect in return. This is only one dimension. How do you go about uh, prioritizing? Operation budget. I'm sorry? Operation budget. Okay, so what you do is you have here investments. Basically, do you have availability? Availability, availability of funds. 
So do you have the budgets to be able to do it? If I ended up all what he has, maybe it comes up to $5 million. I don't have $5 million. I don't have. I have $2 million. What do I do? So the availability of budgets to do it. What else? It's the business model because it's, it's different. Okay, so what you need to do is basically, I will call it, I'll help you, is basically the strategic, the strategic alignment. Which of the two, because if we have franchising in the GCC versus opening our own office, this is Atelier du Miel in France, which is the one that leveraged the most? Here they had their operation. They started, they had nothing, they have now, how many retail outlets? Nine? Eight retail outlets that they have, they have at the airport, they have it across, you know, and they opened this over the past two years. You know, she. Uh, now you have them all, but they need to, I would say, start Tripoli, start the, uh, you know, the South or start others on you do. And France would make sense because it's more aligned. So the strategic alignment, and this is in terms of the synergies, the DNA. So what is the one where you're the best fit at? What they have been doing, they've been setting up their operations and building up themselves and being able to do. Other reasons. You have to prioritize. Uh, expenses are probably part of the return. When you go to the ret you make the investments. This investment is going to generate so much revenue, there will be expenses related to it, and I will have some sort of uh, free cash flow. This free cash flow, I'm going to discount it, and I'll compare it to my investments, and this will give me either internal return, net present value, or return on investment. So the expenses are there. So you have this financial return, availability of funds. Okay, resource, resource, resources. So what you see is you have the availability. Availability, not only of money, availability of resources. So this is, this is what the availability... Do we have the people? Do we have the people to be able to do what we have? To get the people is very difficult, trust me. In Lebanon during these days, as a startup, you have hundreds of other startups that all receive money like you have received money. And what do they do with this money? They go and hire people. So you could imagine what is the level. I mean, I, I won't, I mentioned Michel, he hires someone, gets there, three months the person on the job gets 30% or 40% more to go. Three months, so you have pressure on it to retain the people, to be able to continue is something that is quite important that you have. So availability of resources. Uh, transportation, policies, okay. Uh, or rules. Okay, so this could be everything. It could be uh, human capital. It could be intellectual capital, it could be technology. So you have different types of resources that you need to do the job. Do you have them? Is this something that you could master? You don't, don't. So this is, it's important to do it. And one of the key elements behind, so you have one is the capex. What is the capex needed? What is the opex? Capex is capital expenditure. You know, when you're buying uh, operation expenditure is salaries, wages. The second one is what are your free cash flow? So what is, from this and from this you have what? your internal rate of return, or your net present value, or your payback period. The strategic alignment, you mentioned it. Strategic alignment, which is your synergies. If I do Atelier du Miel in France, I could leverage maybe 20% of the cost that I have in Lebanon and to do it in France. So it makes my French operation more efficient and it makes my Lebanese operation more efficient because I have strong synergies between the two. So this is important to understand. Uh, if I want to be a European player, where do I start? Is France the right country to start in terms of uh, uh, ability to execute? We normally focus on these three. The reality, if it fails, it fails because of this or because of this. It's because strategically it's not the right move and because the ability to execute you don't have. Neither the money, you don't have the technology to be able to do it. And the last one is, is the risk. What are the risk elements that you have for each one? And which one has lower risk? And I'm going to look at return, but I'm always going to look at return compared to the risk level that I have. Okay, so this is quite important. This is not done by companies. It's not done. And if you don't do it, you end up being entrepreneurial and it's your gut feel. Your gut feel is good. I trust your gut feel, but I want to have structure around your gut feel so as to make sure that you have. Yes, Yusam. The question uh, is very clear, however, the timing of and how dynamic should it be, in the, especially in the startups yes. companies? I mean, this is, I think, from what I understand. Yes. We sit, we do it, and then we start. Yes. Addition, dynamic, think of the review and get. I understand. Uh, yeah. I understand. Look, I don't want to make it, uh, but trust me. Uh, you know, b Synchro is not a multinational. It will become a multinational. The company that we were yesterday is not a multinational. They started three years ago. They're also in a startup mode. They had, when we met them, they had about 12 different growth initiatives. 12. 
that they have in it that they had to go through it. And each of them, we are going to put on it. So what I'm saying, you don't need to go through it to What you need is you need to have this in the back of your mind. If you need to have it, you have to have a short one. So it could be a one pager for each initiative, one pager. Is we want to know the investments, we want to know how much return we have, so you're the one who sets what is the, the revenue that we're going to generate. I need to understand, get a sense, is it going to take me two years to recover or five years to recover my investments? I need to know, does it make sense? You know, in terms of, is it aligned to my long-term plan? If there is no long-term plan, sabi. But it means that, but normally you should have a long, is it aligned or not aligned? Are we going sideways or are we building it? And then do we have the right people? Partnerships are important. Don't try to do everything yourself. So having the right partner is quite important. Clear on this? So to answer your question, don't spend, it's not an academic exercise. It's something that becomes gut feel. When I sit down and I do, we're going to do the exercise with B-Synchro, it will take us three to four hours. After three to four hours, we'll have a clear idea about what it takes. When we were with the other company yesterday, it's the same. It's an exercise that you do. You might get some more validation in terms of market sizing and everything. But roughly, you could do this exercise in about three hours. And this is the message behind. Any other questions? I didn't yeah. see the other way around. I mean, uh, all the points are valid, but what about really testing the market? I mean, you spend sometimes six, seven months where you see which product is delivered and which is not. You drop it, you move on. Yes. So, especially mm. in our case, and in the Goldfish, where we move from project based uh, approach to product based approach. I mean, the, we still, you know, we don't have a 100% mature product yet, we have a lot of good products. Yes. So when you go to the market, okay. this reactivity. Very important point. Very, very important point. Mantis, for instance, is launching their set of products. What do we told them? Do prototyping, ideation. But it's very inexpensive. So you ideate, you do a prototype. We have business model canvas to help you. And then basically get focus group. Get a few people who are your potential customers. Add them on. We did a focus group. We got feedback. Validate. Does this make sense or doesn't make sense? Is this pricing the right pricing? Is this product feature the right feature? Right? So this customer focus group is very important. And every one of you need to do it. And we don't use, of course, software, but this is a very inexpensive way to test the market. So I'm completely with you. So it's not only about the academic exercise. It's get your customers around it, uh, on it. Get some validation from the customer. So this is a way to validate what? What you're telling me is validate this. Because if the customer is not behind it, forget your free cash flow. So do the validation, do the testing in the market, try to do it in a cost-effective way because we need to learn from it. We tried it for three months or six months, it didn't work, but then, then pull out. You know, the problem that we have, especially in the Middle East, I work with big groups, is that they get attached to the product and it becomes part of your family. نحن حطيناك هون كسي أو للشركة لا تزبطنا إياها ما لا ت ت تلنا إنه لازم نفكرها وشو اسمه. But these are very difficult decisions to take. So this portfolio uh, optimization is important because it tells you which one to go in, but it also tells you which one you need to get out of. وهذه مهمة. So so I fully with you. Get prototyping. Uh, do testing uh, of the idea. Focus group is one way, uh, a market research, quick market research is another way. Launching it in one country first to start, or not in a country, to do it in one city to see how it works, and then deciding to expand to a country or other. So you have different ways to be able to validate your assumptions. And these validations are critical. So it's not only a number game or a strategic game, it's really about a market validation game. Okay, any other questions? But this is important again, and very few companies do it, and they're forced to do it. Because at the end of the day, your resources are limited. <coughs> your financial resources are limited. You have raised funds, you have each one of you have raised funds, you, but these funds will not last forever. They will last for a year, they might last for two years. So you better do your testing and make sure that you have the right business model before moving forward. Yes, Eddie? Uh, can we have brands positioning? As well as the uh, you could have brands because this is we cover brands a little bit later, but we brand is uh, is important in um, so specifically what you want in terms of yes. If you what's the added value by opening this market before this market? Yes. What's the added value on, on my brand? Yes. In France? Yes. By like coming to GCC? Yes. Or going to GCC from London? Okay, exactly. So this is, it's a good question. You have heard this question. So how, what is the role of the brand to prioritize your opening? Clearly, if you go to Lebanon, from Lebanon to GCC, versus if you go to France and you are the leading, and they can be the leading honey producer and distributor in France, 
then it becomes a hot potato in uh, GCC all over the world. Because then you come up with a French brand, which are supposed to be the best honey makers in the world, and you're competing and you're number one. Coming from Lebanon, but it doesn't have the same appeal. So f positioning from a brand perspective, where is my brand going to be most impacted on? And if it's building the French operation, which seems the case, then it makes sense to do it. Now the issue that you're facing, he's not here, I was with him yesterday, is that to open France is very uh, capex intensive. Because you know, trying to get locations, you have here eight locations across Beirut, trying to get eight locations in Paris, I tell you it's going to be five times the price. So this means in terms of rent, in terms of the salaries of the people that you have, so trying, and this is why most of the competitors in France have won one, two stores. This is what they have. You have eight stores here. Imagine if you have five stores, you become the number one producer in France. Nobody has five stores. Why? Because part of it is because of the cost element behind, and you have a limited budget. And your shareholders here, us included, we're on your back. We want to make sure that Lebanon is profitable, that you have your things before you start exporting. I know the last thing we want you is to spread yourself in. So this is strategic alignment becomes important, and budgets. So the budget. So we want you, we gave you the money. At a big amount of money, we want you to deliver returns to us. So it's a different ball game. So strategically from a band it makes sense, but in terms of ability to execute and budget is the other one. And you have to, we have, so we have to succeed here, we have to make our numbers here, and then we will go back to the shareholders. And if the shareholders are not interested, other shareholders will be. So this is, but at least you've done your job here in terms of the, any other questions? Okay, important exercise. Okay, this is, uh, this is another one. That, this is the one that we typically use to position you. So what you have today is you have current products and you have future products. You have current markets and you have future markets. Uh, so what you do is what is here, the, uh, so this was which example we had. I forgot what is the, uh, okay, this is yesterday. So uh, this is fresh out of the press. So here they have expansion. They're pretty much in Beirut today. Now what they want is they need to be in the south, they need to be in the Beka, and they need to be in the north. So this is using current products that they have. So these are photovoltaic cells to produce electricity, and they want to do it in current markets, which is, uh, which is Lebanon. So how do they do it? They do it by expanding outside Beirut. And this is one of their strategies that they're going after. So the second one is they look at their existing products, but they say, Constantin, we want to do it in sub-Sahara Africa. We have Tanzania, we have Kenya, we have a number, and they have hub heavy, heavy donors that are contributing. This is going to be another growth opportunity that they have. We want to export, I don't know which is the one, export products. So they have Dubai industry. So they, they want to do, uh, to go and export into Dubai and set up their operation for the GCC. They have a product, a big project, it's a desalination project in Cyprus. This is a major project we want to go. So this is taking existing technology across other products. Or what you do is you have your product, I want to introduce new product. So here it's assessment. This is we do assessment services and we provide this and we build it. So it's not about a product sale, it becomes we sell you the service and we sell you a total solution behind it that you have. So this is example, it's called the Ansoft mat matrix. This Ansoft matrix is the way for you to position it. Current product, current markets, future product, current markets. Here is basically if you, for instance, they're producing uh, solar in Lebanon, is you produce uh, wind energy in uh, South Africa. So this will become a new technology, a new product in a new market. So this is, now once you've positioned them on this matrix, then you go through the exercise that we have done, and then you help, and this is again, it's a company of the same size of most of your company, even smaller. How do you go about deciding which one to introduce where? And this exercise, we're doing it with them. Okay, so this is another example. It's Ansoft matrix to help you picture it. Now, uh, distribution, uh, Bitcoin Mai, and a bit the Mai. Somebody else wants water. Uh, okay, distribution channel. Now I've mentioned distribution channel. Uh, sorry. Okay, what are the typical distribution channels that you face? Okay. Uh, direct, you have direct. Semi-direct. Semi-direct is what? Decide to go, let's say, in Saudi Arabia as a semi direct and have a distributor. Yes. Who will be only responsible of logistics and things. Yes. And uh, all the legal things in the country, but also shipping and uh, uh, all the operational aspects of the business. Yes. So now, we, as a company, we will deal with everything related to the customer pricing, margins. Okay. So we set the margin for the distributor. So okay. And we keep the 
the power of uh, the market. And okay. Uh, uh, a fully distributor. Uh, okay, so you have direct sales force. We some would sell direct. He could have a distributor in Saudi Arabia. He might decide after the distributor becomes big, Michel would say, I want to have a joint venture. Even though I'm not 51% older he is, I want to create a joint venture. So you could start with a distributor, move to a joint venture, and in some countries, if you legally could do it, have a fully owned subsidiaries. So you're testing the market. Or complete or continue with a distributor. What are the sales channels? You could have resellers. Wholesale is another one. So you have resellers. You could have wholesalers. Nabil, what are the... They're not. They're okay. There are differences. Eh. Hey. Hey. In our case, we have business partners. Yes. Which means uh, we have level one and level two, which are, for example, partners which are just introducers, others which are actually in the, uh, are involved in the implementation and project management. Yes. This difference. It differs. I mean, the introducer is a good one. You know, an HP. There was some market we couldn't get in. So we called them, we had a special contract with people who are opening the doors. We call them deal finders. We call them whatever, I don't want to know. Because it's an American company, but we knew that if we don't have this, we will not be able to get into this market. So you have different types. Now the question that you need to see is what is the types that is addressing, that is the best position to take your product and to be able to sell it to your customers. <coughs> and initially, Wissam, if Wissam doesn't go and sell with the distributor to prove to the uh, customer and to the distributor that this is how we do a sales cycle, the distributor is not He could try, and Joanna, where is Joanna? She was here. She tried with Kuwait for several. You need to have the local contact. You need to train your distributor. You probably need to sell yourself direct before, and the distributor sh sees how it happens, then you are equipped to have the right person. So you're going to have a numerous type of distribution channel. I'm going to list them. Now the same thing I've done with your products, and I've looked at your product portfolio. I'm working with a company in Kenya, it's African Cotton. This African Cotton, they're, they're competing with Procter & Gamble. So they have distributors, they have a direct sales force, they have wholesalers, they sell to retailers, diverse. What, how do we do about deciding what is the right distribution channel for your company? How do you go about it? I mean, try and error could be one, you could try it. But what would be the criteria at the end of the day that you decide? I mean, I'm giving you the example. I won't mention the company, but they had 2,000 customers. They had 2,000 customers. They're producing Kleenex and equivalents. So they are pampers. They're doing the uh, uh, Kleenex, everything which is based out of paper. So you have tissue paper, toilet paper, uh, all this they're distributing. They have 2,000 customers direct, and they had about 100 wholesalers. This is how they worked. How would you go to know, and they had a few direct sales force, so they, how would you know whether this is the right uh, model? Yes? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you, we will go to this one, yes? So we have financials? Resources. Which resources? To be able to manage all the different distribution, what else? Okay, so where are your customers? How can you approach, what is the best way to approach your customers? So customer reach is one, what else? Okay, we, we, we have segmented our customers, we've done their needs. We, uh, I'm, 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 my presentation goes on these steps. So who are the customers? So what you have in it. Normally what you do, I mean all your answers are good answers. But at the, end, at the end of the day, first you start by your customers. Where are your customers better served in terms of the, the need? So what is the first one is who is best to address the need of your customers on it. Now what it happens, that in the second, is you have to look at the return, you will see the same way I'm looking at your product portfolio and I'm going to ask you for each of the product that you are offering, tell me your margins. Some of these products are 80% margins, other products are 20% margins. Why would I push a 20% margin when I have 80% margin? The same thing is with your accounts. They're selling, for instance, to all the supermarkets. Nakumat, you're not in South Africa. Nakumat is the largest supermarket that you have in East Af Africa. It was the largest volume. 10% of their business was going through Nakumat. But Nakumat, the margin they were making with them was 2%. With all the other supermarkets, they're making 20% plus. Nakumat was the key one. So this is the big issue. So you look at it, and you look at the actual performance of this channel and see how you have on it. Now, it's, it's, uh, so one of it is the customer need. The second one is the same way you look at your product and you look at the profitability of pro product. You need to do the same thing with your distribution channel and you will see that some distribution channels are much more effective than others. Yes, Wissam? I, I, I agree with you, however, I, mean, I think a bit like, uh, I mean, 
I mean, for any company, if you want to go direct, you need to have the capex and opex and the return on investment that you need to go direct in this market. Especially the life cycle of the, uh, the company, if it's a new company, you can never go direct in a, uh, in a market uh, with having all the money that you need to spend, spend like if they want to go to France. Yeah, but he's going direct. When they started, Eli is going direct. All he's doing is direct. He has retail outlets, but he's going direct. You are doing direct. He's not in France. Hey. I mean, France is a country also, perhaps, that allows you to do this kind of freedom to collect here. Most the market trends is very the market trend is very important. I don't know, but for my side, for the medical device industry, in the area of the Minat, uh, it's a distributor or semi-direct maximum channel of management with all the customers, and the customers are all uh, used to this and only deal in this uh, management side. I want to go direct, and I need to, uh, it's like HP going into Turkey. When did HP go to Turkey? When the distributor came a certain like phase, yeah. The distributor yeah. is true. It's true. It's true. So, I'm completely with you. Yeah. No, but they have their indirect, they have their retail outlets that they, they will, if the, they might even have franchising where they go, which is also an indirect way, or they have the direct sales. Why do I want direct sales? Because it's critical to get to the needs of the customers. The, the company in Kenya, what we decided, we don't need to sell them direct. We want to focus on our key accounts. We have 100 key accounts. These are the key accounts, but we want to go deeper in these key accounts. So this is quite important. And then the rest, in terms of having you know, hundreds or 200, we're going to find six or seven distributors. Then we give them a region. These distributors have a much larger business with us, and then we need to make sure that we have the right distribution. So we decided direct with one. We decided to have limited distributors on it. You have pros and cons. There is no one way. Geographically, for, for me, GCC, it doesn't make sense to, to go through distribution channel in particular. I, I, uh, I fully agree. There is no one solution. So no, depending on each one. Depends on the office and set the key kind of business. You can, you can also uh, go for reseller, but there is a lot of people who can do the execution of our projects or our deals just from legal tendering perspective and local presence. But Besides this, uh, from sales uh, force or from a business development perspective, my target or my market in the Middle East is clear. Let's take away it's 100 insurance company. I can reach out to most of them and speak with them directly. Why do I need a distribution? How do you go channel? to go to Quay? Uh, whether through uh, calling them, whether through. How uh, do you know the customers in the market? It's easy market for me. It's, it's the same thing as for you. You, you knew. You knew Okay, you knew the cardiologist, you knew that you had to go through, you need, you're doing direct, you're now doing direct with a distributor. Ultimately, you'll have a distributor and the distributor yeah. will, will do it. It's the same with him. He's now doing direct on this because he has a few customers, the same way you have few customers. Both of you have a very similar, completely different industry, but you have a very similar model. You have a number, you have 50 uh, probably potential in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. He probably has also 50 or 60 uh, potential. So we know them by name. You know them by name. He knows them by name. I have all the direct but the for Africa, it's completely uh, different. I mean, for Africa, uh, they don't work on maybe uh, I don't know, but they, uh, I've never been there, so I assume that there is a cultural barrier. So a distributor is, has more sense for me to have it. But here in GC, is, you know, it's, it's Lebanese. Yeah. But the difference is not, I cannot access the customer. The distributor in the protocol set. The unknown man, the advantage experience. We, 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 could, we could discuss it for a long time, All what I, and I fully agree with you. It's depending on the, the type of uh, product you have, it depends where you are on your uh, product life cycle, it depends on the sector, it depends on the... So I'm with you. What I'm saying is that there is no one size fit all. Each one of you would have. So this is the message I'm passing on. But what I'm willing to do is sitting down with you when you have your sales model and ask you a few questions to see whether your model is really address your distribution model to this and is this the most effective way to get to your customer. This is for me what's important. Is can we make, because in this case when we change in Kenya, yeah, the uh, distribution, we realize that with these key customers, this is where we're making the big amount. We need to have more of those. What does it take to have more of those? It was a question of pricing. We adapted the pricing to be able to get more key accounts. 
for the distribution, we went to distributors, what do you need? They said, uh, we need to have a number. We don't want to be competing with 100 others. We want to be the only one in our region. We want to have exclusivity. So we tested it. We tested it in one region, in Mombasa region on the coast, to see how it works. We looked at it for about three months. We realized that it's working. Then we decided we want to have, this is the profile of the distributor. These are the ones that are most important. We're going to appoint across six different regions and we go with it. We might change it in a year or two years down the road. What I'm saying is you have different ways to address it, look at alternatives and see and then sit down with other people to be able to validate. You know, you have a, around this, this room here, you have about six or seven different sales and distribution models. So what are these? Uh, wholesaler or distributor, you could have a differentiation between the two, basically who carries stock, who doesn't carry stock. The value-added reseller is the reseller value-added because he's adding his software or he's adding other components and providing a total solution. A dealer, straight dealer that you have, it could be a consultant, somebody who is here to influence in terms of the pricing, influencing the decision making, a sales agent, uh, retailers, you have direct, direct could be direct sales force, but you could have direct telesales over the phone, so you don't need to have, you do the initial sale, other people would follow up to back you up when you are uh, in the office to be able to make quotations and others. So these are different ways to do in terms of distribution channel. So what you need at the end, what I want is I want to know who is your, off, what are your products, what are the sales channels that you're using, direct and others, and what is your targeted region. So I need to have a plan of which product, through which channel, to which market. And then I will spend time with you and go through it and trying to see is this the optimal mix. Okay, so uh, uh, this is another example, what you have different products here. And you have, normally what I would ask you for these products, how much are you going to make this year? What is your projected, what are sort of investments you need? On these investments, what are the projected revenue? What are the margins you're going to make? This might give me a little bit of a financial return. Which product makes more sense, giving these margins and giving these investments? So this is basically back to the IOR, are you, uh, uh, return on investment level. Okay, now this is an example of what we do with the, uh, when we do the transformation plan with the uh, Stanford Seed companies. Is we tell them, we want basically your sales and marketing. It's not only marketing strategy. We want to have three things. We want to know your scope. We want to know your competitive advantage. And we want to know what is the logic that you will have to win. These are the three things. If you could articulate these three things in a clear way, then I would understand. So what is the scope? In the scope, Tell me what is your product. What are the products that you're selling? Tell me to what markets are you selling and tell me who are the customers on those markets. So identify to me your product, your customer and the market that you have. Tell me what they are today and what are they going to be in five years down the road. So don't only give it to me today, give it to me also so I need to have a chance. So this is the scope. It's very simple. What product, to which customers, in which markets. Then I will ask you, how different are you versus the competition? Your unique selling proposition, what are the elements where you differentiate? Is it price? Is it availability? Is it delivery? Is it quality? Is it the quality of the service? And what sort of IP protection you have or what sort of technology protection you have? So how sustainable is your competitive advantage? So the first thing is the scope on it. Scope is your product, the customers, the market. What is your competitive advantage and why would you win? Why are you going to win today and why are you going to win in three or five years? And they're not easy answers, questions to answer. So this is here, what is the path? What is the cap capacity or core competency that you're going to be building? And what is in terms of the, uh, it could be your structure, it could be the uh, uh, different element that you have. I'm going to show you an example. This is one of the companies that I'm currently working in. I'm sitting on their board. It's a pharma company. So this is a company. So they have a strategic goal within five years to transition to be an agile West African pharmaceutical powerhouse, manufacturing high margins, targeted medicine, there is some spelling mistakes, delivering uncommonly outstanding customer service to a wide range of wholesalers and distributors. So what is their market? Nigeria in 2017. What is going to be their market in 2020? Nigeria and the entire West Sub-Sahara Africa. So this is uh, Ghana, uh, Senegal, uh, Ivory Coast on it. What is their customers? Primarily distributors and hospitals. Who are their customers? Mega distributors, distributors, wholesalers that they want to have, some NGOs, trade fairs, so they would list. This is the segment of the market. What is the product? This is their product offering today. What is the new product that they're coming back? Anti-malaria, antibiotics, multivitamins. So this is their product offering that they have. 
What is that competitive advantage today? What is that competitive advantage going to be in the future? What, uh, this is the competitive, unique selling proposition. This is pretty much, no, this is the logic for winning. No, this is the logic that they have on it. So basically the two can be merged in one. But this is a way, in one slide, I need to know where are you today? Where do you want to be in terms of country or coverage? What is your customer? What will be your customer in the future? What are the products? What is your competitive advantage today? And what is it going to be the logic for you to win? If you could put me this on one page, this will be good. So how many of you can articulate it today, for if I ask you? Wissam, can you articulate? Uh, so for instance, if I ask you your market today, what is your market today? To be honest, uh, I cannot You cannot, okay, it's fine. He's new on the job. New He's new. Okay, but let me help you. Let me help you. Sami is on your board. So we will say, so with Sami, we're going to help you. Today, what you're operating, you're primarily operating in the three GCC countries that you have. Okay, your plans in the future is to operate also in the US. You want to be present in the US. You want to be present in Lebanon. And hopefully, you want to be present across the Middle East region. So this will be one way. This is a possibility that we will need to discuss and get validation from the board. Who are your customers today that you have? So what, I don't want to go through it, but it's a way that I would ask you. So if you could put it to me and put it to me on one pager, I could then sit down with you and be able to ask you the question and validate it. Okay? Is this clear in terms of the way we segment it? Is this something missing in this? Clear? Okay. So it's, uh, and it reminds me in school, when somebody asks a question, this is the reflex. But yeah, wait a second. Yes, I'm not sure. Saint Antoine. Saint Antoine. How much? Eh, how many people are there? Okay, I'm not sure. 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 Anyway, so look, this is one way of doing it. It's a simple way to do it, but trust me, it is difficult to answer some of these questions. And this is one way of putting your sales and marketing map together, is being able to do it. Then we will discuss it. This normally is a subject to be presented to the board and get approval from the board on doing it. Clear? Okay, let's move in. Hala balashna with the real stuff. Kilo abel haki. Positioning, marketing, distribution channel, segmentation. Here is, uh, uh, and most of you have it. If you don't have it, we will have it. Uh, with some, you need to get ready to, uh, to present yours. So we will have, so what we do is a funnel. It basically comes from prospects that you have, contacts. You've established a contact here. So you've met with the person. You have a lead. The person that you've met has a need. This need, you think you could fulfill it. Uh, you basically have submitted your proposal. You're in the final shortlist, and you're closing the deal. Now, some of you might have seven layers, some of you might have eight layers, some of you have four, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the logic is all the same, is you need to get prospects. So this is the first thing, is where are you getting your prospect? How are you getting the prospect? And then you need to start qualifying them. Every time you move down here, every time your probability of winning increases. Here it's 100%, here it's 10%, and then all the way move from 10 to 30 to 50 to 70 to 100. So this is how we have a funnel is I come in from this, so here we looked at uh, CEOs and chef of donut franchising that don't know about our own bacon donut recipe. This is a person producing donut recipe. So they don't know, but these are existing and they could use it. So we have here CEO and chef, we have contacted by phone, email or in person. A contact has been established. Here we move to who have requested samples and are more information about the bacon donut recipe and its ingredients. Okay. Here is CEO who have ready to make a purchase but want to check out our flavor and development companies first to make sure that they are not making a foolish. So every time we move to this, every time the probability is higher, every time we have made more commitment to the customer. This is a funnel. A funnel needs to be filled. Your role as sales manager is fill this funnel. How do we fill a funnel? How do we fill a funnel? Okay, so you have direct sales. What else? Market research. You could get what else? What? Exhibition that you get. Absolutely. What else? Database that you could have that you could buy. Uh, you have database existing on it. Uh, how do you get your customers, Eddie? 
database. Database. So you both by database. Focus, group. focus groups. Focus group. Focus group. Yeah. But did you buy? To reach the leads. To reach the leads. Okay. So, but did you have to buy database? Yeah, your border-based database. Okay, so you see, so you have different ways to do it. So all your net, your network, your contact, database, exhibition, direct sales, all these things are ways to. Be, you need to fill it. You need to fill it. Then when you fill it, how do you go about clarifying it? So what are the key things that you need to do in order to make sure that this is a qualified funnel? What are the things you do to qualify it? You do the research. Basically, ask questions. Ask questions. This is what you have to do. Validate it. Is the money available? That is the need available? Uh, is, there a, is there an authority uh, to, to make? So these are the ways to be able to come and to close the funnel. Now the funnel is important, why? Because at the end of the day, we basically need to come up with a return to our customers. Today, most of you, the only thing that you know is your costs. Most of you, I will tell you what is your cash burn rate. Why? Because it's mostly salaries. You have some raw materials if you're producing or importing on it, but in most of your cases, your software companies or your technology companies, it's about salary. You know your cost structure. So this is the most easy to predict. The only unknown that we don't have is your revenue, top line. How do we get your revenue? I need a forecast. Why do I spend so much time when we are at board? The first thing I want to look at is my cash flow forecast. Yesterday with Elie's boss, I told him, look, I have your income statement, I have your balance sheet, I want to know your forecast. I want to know your forecast for the last six months, I want to know your forecast for the next six months. This is the most important thing for me, is you manage by your cash flow. So this is the ability to do. How do we do the cash flow forecast? The most, because the rest I have, the cost structure I have, the only thing I don't have is my sales forecast. I don't have it. The funnel gives me my sales forecast. So now, Wissam, are you ready to uh, explain? 